it's a pleasure to introduce Stephen Becker. Um, I've known Stephen for a while, probably initially through climbing. <laughs> but anyway, um, Stephen does a bunch of interesting work in randomized linear algebra, compressed sensing related things, um, machine learning uh, sort of, uh, topics, and he's an affiliate faculty in our department. Um, and I'm excited to see his come. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for the invitation, Jed. Happy to be here. Um, so I'm going to talk, and I don't have a set agenda, so if I don't make it to the end, that's okay. Um, so if you want to ask questions along the way, that's okay. So I'm going to talk about some randomized methods, um, other than randomized things like stochastic gradient descent. Um, and this is mostly work with my three former students, Farhad, David, and Osman. So they've worked for the past, going back to about 2016, to just a couple of years ago on this topic. So I'm going to start by giving you some information on sketches, what I mean by what are random sketches. And then I'll introduce them from easy and getting sort of more and more complicated. And then the second part of the talk will be applications of using those sketches um, to different things like machine learning and so on like that. So I want to motivate, what are we trying to do with this randomized sketching? We're trying to reduce dimensionality. So we're taking a data set. So for me, a data set is a matrix like X so I'm going to think of it as an applied mathematician, not like a computer scientist. I'm going to think of uh, data points as columns, not rows. Okay, so I have a bunch of different columns, my data points. So I have P features here and different data points. And the idea of dimensionality reduction is to reduce the dimension. So I'm going to make it smaller. I'm going to make it a small matrix here where that one P dimension is now a small P dimension. Okay, so I'm going to do that. And a common way to do that is with a linear uh, operator. Okay, so phi is a linear operator here, and it's just a matrix multiply. So that's most of my work is going to be with that. Why would we want to do this? The main motivation is doing things faster. So sort of obviously, well, if it's a smaller matrix, things are faster. The big thing here is that if I have a data set that's so big, it doesn't fit into memory of a computer. If I can now fit into memory because it's smaller, that's a huge savings there's no communication cost, so there's less cost, okay? So that's sort of the big motivation. There's other reasons you can do it too, denoising, uh, so you don't overfit for the processing, so on like that. Okay, so warm up. Let's do something most of us have seen. Let's do PCA, so principal component analysis. And the idea is I take a matrix, I take my X matrix, I'm gonna decompose it with the SVD, and then I use the top left eigenvectors to project it onto a smaller eigenspace. So this is used all over the case. Here's an example of some, um, some genome data where we have a huge high dimensional data set where like millions of features. And then we're gonna compress it here just to two features. And then we can visualize it and get something useful out of it. So it's used a lot, it's a common technique. For our purposes, the way I think of it is, it's not quite what I want. It's a bit too slow and it's not linear. So it's sort of linear in the sense that if you give me the SVD, I have these matrices, U1 is the left singular vectors. I can use that to form this linear projection. So then I can do my linear projection, but it's nonlinear because it actually depends on X itself to make the linear operator. Okay, so for me, it's nonlinear. It's a bit slow. There's a lot of work on doing this fast, but uh, a lot of the times for the things we want to use it for, it's just, if you took the time to do this, it'd be too slow already. Okay, so let's talk about the first real sketch I wanna talk about, where I'm gonna use simpler things, simpler than PCA, but faster. So the first thing here is uh, random row sampling. We're gonna take features and just throw some out. That's the idea, right? So I have something that's p-dimensional, and let's have a sampling operator where I just keep a few of those dimensions, just a few features. Okay, so pretty simple idea, very fast to apply. Um, okay, now the question is how do we choose those features? Which ones do we keep? So a simple way is let's just do it uniformly at random. That's cheap, uh, but it doesn't work very well at all. Okay, so that's sort of a bad idea. It's done a lot in practice. If we just have a lot of features and we think they're all equally useful, then we could just keep some at random. So another way to say that is basically, if I think each row is about the same, say a magnitude or an independence or something like that, then I could just randomly subsample. Okay, if we want some guarantees, we could do something more clever. So we could do something with like, row norm, that is look at which rows are larger and select those with higher probabilities. So just weighted subsampling. Okay, so that's another option. A better option 
is leverage score sampling. Okay, so what is leverage score subsampling? Well, it's like taking that row norm, but instead of taking the row norm of my data matrix, I take it of a basis for the column space of my matrix. So if you've seen a QR or the SVD decomposition, I'm just taking the left singular vectors or the Q from the QR and using that and finding the norms of those rows. So it's sort of more fundamental and we get much better results if we do this technique, okay? So I'm gonna find each sides of each row here and then sample the rows of my X matrix according to a weighted distribution weighted by those, those sizes. Okay. Okay, now another classical sketch I want to talk about is a fully random sketch where I, the simplest example is a Gaussian matrix. So I take a Gaussian matrix. So phi is a Gaussian matrix with P small rows and uh, P columns and just a fully Gaussian matrix. And it turns out, this is sort of known in the 1980s, that if you do this and scale it properly, it's an approximate isometry. So what does that mean? It means, an isometry means we preserve uh, distances. So it means here, if I have a data point, a data set with n different data points in the data set, if I look at all the pairwise distances between those, those n squared such pairwise distances, all these terms here, xi minus xj, when I embed it into the smaller matrix, phi times x and phi times xj, that distance is about the same. It's almost equal to one with some little plus and minus epsilon factor. Okay. So when I do this, the larger my embedding space is, the smaller I can make epsilon. And we see that, how big is P small? Well, if epsilon small, then it has to get larger. So it depends on what are epsilon squared. There's other factors in there. So it depends on the number of data points I have. I have N data points. Therefore, there's N squared pairwise distances I want to preserve. So you might think naively, maybe I need about N squared rows. Well, you don't, you need log N rows. Okay, so that's pretty cool. If I have a lot of data points, if I have a huge data set where n is really large, I only pay a small logarithmic factor in that. But the other amazing thing here, this is why this is sort of a famous result, is because it's completely independent of the original dimension p. I use that for scaling, but it doesn't affect the size of my sketch. So I could start off with a billion dimensions, or there's only like if n is say 13 and I choose an epsilon like 0.01, it doesn't matter if I start in a billion dimensions, it doesn't affect my results at all. So that's pretty neat. So that's sort of what we would now say, this is like a gold standard. Okay. Uh, it's a gold standard, but we don't want to use it, um, mostly because it's too expensive. Uh, I mean, so in some cases, it's not a big deal. It depends on the application. But we're going to talk today about things that are faster than this. I also want to talk about generalizations. So generalizations would be like, okay, so I said each entry here is IID normal. I can generalize that to sub-Gaussian, that's sort of technical. Uh, I can make it dependent rows by, like, say, normalizing them. More exciting for us is I could have it have dependent columns. So we're going to come back to this because I'm actually going to ask for cases where my phi matrix has orthonormal columns. And they're going to be random, but orthonormal. And they can't be independent if they're normal, if they're orthogonal to each other. Okay. So I'm going to come back to that. We'll call it the Haar measure on orthogonal matrices, or just the Haar matrix for short. There's also cases where you can make it sparse, so it's random, but it's say it's the entry zero with probability uh, one minus p, uh, let's not use p, let's say q, and it's plus or minus one with probability uh, q. Okay. It doesn't work quite as well, but you get some guarantees. Okay, so these are all fairly classical. Let's move on. What I'm gonna talk about now is structured sketches. These are a bit more modern, and they're trying to do the same thing, but just trying to be faster in different ways. So the first one we're going to introduce is the fast johnson lemon strauss which is just like a johnson lemon strauss but faster. So it has similar guarantees, not quite as good, but good enough for most uh, theorems we might want to prove about uh, showing this works. But it's very structured to make it fast. So what does that mean? It's going to be the multiplication of these three matrices together. D is a diagonal matrix with plus and minus ones at random on the diagonal. Okay, we'll call those Rademacher random variables on the diagonal. Applying that to, if I multiply this times a vector, that's really fast because it's diagonal, so that's linear time. Then I have a Fourier matrix, really any unitary matrix. What I want for the theorems to work is I want the maximum entry of F to be as small as possible. Now it's unitary, so it's normalized. So they can't be arbitrarily small, but to make them as small as possible, another way to say is I want them spread out so they're evenly sized. I want them all about the same size. So very bad choice, 
will be to choose F as the identity matrix. That's orthogonal, but some entries are zero and some are one. That's the largest possible uh, difference you can have. So I want them all to be about size one over square root of P. That's sort of optimal. Okay, so the Fourier transform is a perfect uh, choice for that. And then after doing that, I'm gonna do this subsampling, the one we already saw, I'm gonna do simple subsampling where I choose it uniformly at random. Okay, as I said, that was a bad idea. But after putting it through these operators first, maybe it's not such a bad idea. Okay. So why do we do this? Well, we're going to do it because it works and it's fast. So why is it fast? Because all of these things are fast and I apply them in sequence. Okay, right, because I can apply an FFT in uh, N log N or P log P time. Okay, and I get some guarantees. So how do I get those guarantees? How does that work? Because I just said simple uniform row sampling is a bad idea. Well, it's a bad idea if each row is maybe one's more important than another, like if they're different sizes. But what happens is after I go through this D and F transform, after that, provably, each row is now about the same size. The chance that it deviates from the average size is quite small. Okay, so I can sort of do this pre-processing to make it about uniform. Therefore, if I do uniform subsampling, that's about the same as leverage score sampling, because leverage scores would be uniform. So it's sort of like leverage score sampling, which has some guarantees, right? I haven't given you the details of those guarantees, but that's the high level idea of why that works. Okay, what else could we do? This is a different kind of sketch. It's sort of the odd one out because before I was, it was a linear operator applied to each column. This is a linear operator. If I think of my matrix as one big vector itself, but this can be, if I think of it as a bunch of different columns stacked together, then it's a different linear operator for each column. So what is this? I'm just going to pick a bunch of entries and keep them, maybe rescale them to correct for the magnitude. And the other ones I'll just drop. So I'll make a sparse matrix by randomly keeping some entries and scaling. And so it's a very simple idea. Uh, it's been done in practice for forever, probably, and at least analyzed a little bit since uh, for 20 years or so. Okay, so we can do that. Um, okay, we're going to come back to that in a little bit. We're going to come back to that, uh, in fact, right now. So what are we going to do? So I said we could do some simple subsampling for the same reason that the row sampling is not a great idea. Just choosing a bunch of entries at random is not a great idea because you might miss the big ones that are important. Okay, so what are we going to do instead? We're going to first apply that same uh, first two things of the fast Johnson Linda Strauss, that D and F. I'm going to call those preconditioning matrices for now, right? Not preconditioning the typical linear algebra sense, but in our sense of making things uniform. So I apply those and then I subsample the entries. Okay. So we're going to do that. And what, what's the idea? Same idea as in the fast Johnson Linus Strauss. If I'm going to subsample, uh, I don't want to do it uniformly at random. That's a bad idea. I want to do it non-uniformly depending on how large the entries are. But figure out how large the entries are means I have to look at every single entry. That's kind of expensive. So I don't want to have to do that. Um, so I'm going to do the same preconditioning so that everything's about the same size. Okay. Then when we analyze this in theorems, we're going to have analysis that sort of has theorems depending on the largest entry in my matrix. And I want that to be as small as possible. Now, of course, I might as well, I, I should scale things with something. Otherwise, I'll just scale everything and get a vacuous result. So I have some scaling. So suppose my columns are scaled like this. Then I want this to be as small as possible. How small it could be? It could be 1 over square root of p. That's the best possible to have the maximum entry uh, be that small. But it could be like a one and then all zeros, in which case I'd have this, and that's bad. So I want to avoid that and get this kind of this dependence here. Okay. And that's what we can show is that after we do this preconditioning, the chance of us exceeding one over the square root of p is very small. Now we're going to exceed it maybe by a small square root of log factor. Uh, that's pretty small. So we don't have, we're not going to exceed it by much after this preconditioning. Okay. And we can prove theorems saying things like, okay, um, we're going to apply this in a minute to k-means. So for k-means, we're going to talk about averages. We're going to look for a sample average. <clears throat> if I have a true sample average, or if I take a sample average after doing this sparsification, how much can they disagree by? That's what our theorem is saying. And we're saying that, well, the chance of them disagreeing by some amount t decays exponentially in t, depending on some quantities here, which depend on how large things are. And if I do my preconditioning, then I can say that the largest things here are actually quite small. With high probability, they're very small. Okay, that gives me a good result. Okay, so that's sort of how we put that together. 
Um, that's just one of the examples of, of the results we have. Um, as a quick aside, some of you have seen lots of probability. If you haven't seen a lot, the idea for these kinds of results here is that we're not doing sort of basic probability like Chebyshev and Markov inequalities. We're doing the Chernoff trick, where we sort of exponentiate things and then maximize things. We get these concentration inequalities, you know, many different types of these, like Bernstein, Hufting, Ch uh, Chernoff, and so on like that. And applying those correctly, you get much, much better bounds. So an example, if I just took uh, my probability 101 results, I would get, if I plugged in numbers like this, the chance of an average deviating from, um, by more than t, say 1 in 100, that's true, but it's not tight. If I apply these uh, tighter bounds for the same setup, um, I get a much tighter bound. It's actually not 1 in 100, it's 1 in 10 to the to, uh, 20. Okay, so the next type of sketch I want to talk about is the count sketch. This comes from the computer science community. It's based on hash functions. For us, we're going to think of it as just a very sparse matrix. So it's a sparse matrix where each column has exactly one non-zero entry. I'm going to choose the location of that entry, the row, at random. In fact, it doesn't have to be completely at random, but for our cases, we'll choose at random. And then the value will be plus or minus one, again, at random. So uh, it's a type of sparse sketch. So the output's not sparse necessarily, but the matrix, I'm, the operator I'm applying to the, my data is sparse, okay? Um, not as good as, a, as the gold standard, like a, a dense Gaussian matrix, but often good enough for some results, okay? And why, would we, why do we like this? Because it's sparse, it's very fast to apply. So I can apply it to a data set very fast, even better, I can apply it to a sparse data set, and I only look at the non-zero entries in that target data set. And then if I have a non-zero entry in my target data set, I sort of look up and figure out where do I send that appropriate entry in my output, okay? So I can apply this in what I call NNZX, that's the number of non-zeros in X. So if my target data set X has say 50 non-zero entries, I can apply this transform and get my output in order 50 times. So very fast to apply. Okay, now let's extend that a little bit. We're gonna to start to get a little fancier. Um, we're gonna talk about the tensor sketch. So this is closer to like the past 10 or 15 years now. Tensor sketch is just a count sketch, but it's a very special count sketch where I'm gonna choose these. Now I said here, I'm gonna choose a location for each entry in a column. I'm gonna choose a location completely at random, uniformly at random. I'm not going to do that quite the same way. Rather, I'm going to put two small count sketches together, and then the output of those will sort of tell me where that thing is going to be in a sense. So to do this, we're going to have to introduce some notation. We're going to talk about tensor products, also known as Kronecker products here. So I'm going to have, uh, I'm going to apply it to something that's p-dimensional, but I'm going to assume that all my columns of my matrix in p-dimensions have a Kronecker structure or a tensor structure. So, there are, so I have a vector V, that's my column, my data column, which is of size P as usual. But now I'm gonna decompose P as P1 times P2 and write this as this tensor product of those two things, okay? I can't always do that, but if I can, then the tensor sketch is a good idea, okay? And we're gonna talk about that. So what is this tensor product? It's just the Kronecker product, if you've seen that. If I have two vectors A and B, the Kronecker product is taking each entry of A and multiplying it by the entire B vector here and stacking it like this. Okay, and so all together I get this thing here. So if, if this had say three entries and said four entries, this would have 12 entries. Okay. Another way to think of it is I could take the outer product. So the outer product has all the same terms as this, so I just have to reshape it in the right way. So this VEC thing is just saying that I'm gonna reshape if I take a matrix like this. VEC reshapes it by stacking the columns on top. Okay, now we can do this for matrices too. We can do it like that. Um, I'm not gonna dwell on the formulas too much. Okay, um, so again, we, we can do it for matrices. Now the count sketch, I'm not gonna go into full details because it would take a little bit of time. So I'm gonna kind of skip a little bit to the punchline and for, just later afterwards, I can show you some extra slides on a little more detail on how this works. But we're gonna take small count sketches and stack them together. So here each S is a count sketch for that size P, uh, or sorry, P sub N in this case. 
I apply that to the subset of the data, well, the, that part of the data, and then I do this, uh, well, I do an FFT, then I do this, this is a cache route product, which is defined here. I do a transpose, then I undo the transpose, then I take an inverse FFT, it looks kind of complicated. What are we really doing there? Well, all this fancy uh, cache route product is doing is doing pointwise multiplication. I'm doing an FFT and then pointwise multiplication and then an inverse FFT, what is that? That's convolution. Okay, so I'm really doing a convolution. Why am I doing a convolution? It turns out what we really want to do is we want to multiply polynomials. We can think of the count sketch interpret it as polynomials. We want to multiply those polynomials uh, to the base of some irreducible polynomial. Okay, and that turns out we can write that as a convolution. Okay, so I'm hiding a lot there. Okay, but it turns out we can apply this fast. This formula here means uh, we have a very efficient way to evaluate this operator. So if my data has this Kronecker product structure like this, if I, so I'm gonna give you the cost for a single multiply of, of a single column, okay? If I wanna do it for the full matrix with N columns, multiply everything here by N, okay? So if I have a single column, if I wanna multiply in reduced dimension with a dense matrix, like a, a Gaussian matrix, the classical johnson lewin strauss it would cost me this, P, which is P1 times P2, times P small. Okay, if I applied count sketch, it's much faster. It's just P, or P1 times P2 in this case. But if I do it as a tensor sketch, instead of having P1 times P2, it's P1 plus P2, plus an extra little factor for the FFT, okay? Um, okay, maybe that doesn't look amazing right now, but it's gonna get more and more amazing as my tensor product structure gets larger and larger, because the same thing happens. Instead of multiplying all these things together, I add them all together. Okay, so we're gonna apply this later to tensor decompositions, and in that case, we're gonna have giant tensors. I'm gonna reshape them. And if I had something naive, I would have this huge uh, price here, which I can't afford. Okay, so let's build a little bit to our, our, our climax of our structured sketches to put all these things together. And here's a fancy sketch. This is the Kronecker fast johnson lewin strauss sketch. Okay, which I'm just picking uh, adjectives and, and adding them all together. So it's gonna be the same idea as before, only the tensor sketch, we combined little count sketches. We're gonna do the same thing where we're gonna take these fast johnson lewin strauss sketches like that, and I'm gonna combine them in a special fashion. I'm not gonna combine them just all together, rather I'm gonna take the D and the F and take a Kronecker product of the D and the F and combine those, and then I'm gonna do random subsampling on that entire giant thing. Uh, so I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do this, this sampling operator R applied to this Kronecker product structure of these two different things here, right? So just like the previous section, I'm assuming input has this Kronecker structure. Then I can apply this. If my input has that structure, when, when I apply this, I can distribute these things inside, do my little matrix multiplies there, which are my FFTs, but they're small FFTs, and then do my subsampling. And there's some tricks, like for example, when I do my subsampling, I never actually look at the entire uh, matrix or vector there. I just pick a column I want to observe and then compute that column I want. Okay, otherwise it's too large. Okay, so this was proposed, the first I know of it is in 2018. And then we saw a paper that analyzed it that came out, this Jin Colton Ward paper in 2020 or so. When it came out, my student Osman saw it come out and he said, ah, they proved it in a different way than I thought they should have. He emailed them and, and asked them about that. And they said, oh yeah, it's just a different way. And they gave him blessing to go in and prove it. So he proved it a different way, um, which is this result right here. And it's better than theirs in some way, worse than theirs in different ways. Um, but it says the following, if I take that setup that I just gave you, uh, and you can, you can do it more than, sorry, that should be a Q. You can do this Q times, not just two times. Um, when I do that, then I get a result that looks like this, just like that original approximate isometry we had from the, from the classical Johnson lewin strauss okay? And we do that, what's the dependence? How large is our embedding dimension here? Well, it has a mild dependence on the number of data points we care about, n, n is always inside the log. And does it depend on p? Uh, it doesn't, it only depends on the p's individually. So I can sort of factor those p's together, uh, factor them out, um, so it's a pretty nice dependence. 
Uh, it does have little things like if I did this where Q is very, very, very large, then we do have a bad dependence there. But if you're just talking about like say a four-way tensor, Q is, is four. So sort of think of it almost like a constant. So we don't scale too bad. Okay. So how do we prove this? Well, it's the same idea we've talked about before that when we apply these kind of D and F operators, we make things approximately the same size and magnitude. Okay, so we do that same thing. Now we they make things about the same size. Then I put a chronicler of those together. That's not quite the same thing, but it's not too far off. So we can sort of show that, okay, if it has a chronicler structure, we know what the leverage scores are in terms of the smaller things. We can sort of, there's a results there. And so we can say, well, if they're not too far off originally after the chronicle product structure, they're not too much worse off. Okay, enough to give us a theorem like this. Okay, and just to compare, the original classical uh, Johnson Linus Strauss looks very similar, uh, same idea. Okay, well, uh, why don't I pause there? Are there any questions on the random sketches, the setup there? Yes. So, I mean, it seems to me actually. Applications can be much larger than the uh, Often, yes. So, yes. And I see that here you're trying to reduce E, not N. Right. So, is there any result for reducing N and E? There, there are, I mean, there is, I would, I would say yes, there's a lot. There's so much that I'm not sure it's like well organized. Like, for example, um, uh, yeah, I know some sub communities that do that, but often with different style techniques. Um, it often just looks a bit different and and results are a little bit different because if you drop a data point, then like, for example, then of course you can't have something that looks like this because you've dropped a data point. Um, so I would say at a high level, yes, people are very interested in that, um, but there's quite a bit of differences in the details. Yeah. So these sketches, are they all, Dimensionality reduction is at the end of all of all. Of yes. Yeah. Exactly. And 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 and, and this, it, with a slight difference that this one of them was sparsifying the matrix. That was sort of the odd one out. And so it's not actually making the dimension smaller, but it's making like the data size smaller. Okay. So, okay. so it didn't seem like the uh, count sketch it didn't seem like this is dimensional. It can. It, it depends on on how extreme that matrix is. So it, it can definitely. You can make those rows pretty small. Okay, let's let's talk about some applications then. So I'm not going to dwell a lot on linear algebra because this is a very well, I would say by now classical. In the past ten years, there's been a lot of work on linear algebra, and so I don't want to focus on that. But I want to give you a, a a taste of what it looks like. So, okay, prototypical example. Like, what do we do over in the applied math department? Well, we solve these squares, and that's we do it in different forms and in different sizes and so on like that. So, uh, can we do sketching to solve these squares? And the answer is yes, there's different ways to do it. So one of the one of the ways I like, I'll start off with, is this approach here. So, okay, this problem is very large, I don't wanna solve it. If I were to solve it though, how could I solve it? One way to do it is with a QR decomposition. Okay, so if you're not familiar with QR, it's taking A. Uh, here, let's assume that P is much bigger than N, so it's a very tall matrix. Okay. So QR, Q is going to be an orthonormal matrix of the same size as A, and then R is a small little triangular matrix, which I can invert easily because it's triangular. Okay, so A is, is orthogonal, okay? The R part is no big deal. You could do a change of variables, uh, but basically, so if I get rid of that R and just look, suppose I just replace A with Q, and so I just have Q times X minus B. How could I solve that? Well, many of us have seen the normal equations for writing down least square solutions. Normal equations are, say, the solution here is A transpose A inverse times A transpose B. So A transpose A inverse. If A is Q and Q is orthonormal, A transpose A is the identity matrix, so there's no inverse. So I mean, just is the inverse itself, okay? So the answer would just be Q transpose B, and then I have to deal with the R, but essentially I can solve it immediately uh, without doing any kind of inverses if I have the QR decomposition, okay? That's one way to do it reasonably in practice. Uh, but that kind of defeats the purpose of doing something faster because finding the QR decomposition, that is how we do this in practice. So I want to do something faster. Okay, so what can I do that's faster? Suppose I sketch A, I do phi times A and make that smaller. So now it's easier to work with. 
And that's why I was careful about how fast phi is, because if phi was too slow to apply, then I might as well have just done a QR on A to start with. Okay, so I want A to be very fast, a phi to be fast. So now I have a small matrix phi times A. I could do a QR on that. If I do a QR on that, uh, okay, then I could, so another way to say is if I did A equals QR exactly, then A times R inverse is Q. Okay, now let's do a QR on this. Now I could do A times R inverse from the R from this QR factorization. That won't give me back the same Q that comes from this QR factorization. Uh, okay, so I can't use that exactly to solve my problem. But what it does mean is that if this thing is a good approximation of A, then at least A times R inverse is well conditioned. Right, in the exact case, when I say A times R inverse is well conditioned, I really mean it's ex perfectly conditioned. Condition number one, I can solve things in one step. If I do it this way, if I do it approximately, it's well conditioned. Like if I choose it to be a good sketch, it could be like condition number four. So that means I can't solve it in one step. What do I do? I do an iterative method, a Krylov subspace method. Um, and when I do that, convergence speed can be bounded by how ill-conditioned you are. So if your condition number is four, it converges super fast. Okay. This is a nice method because it fails gracefully. So if your sketch here is not a very good sketch, like if you don't have enough rows in your sketch matrix, it's not a good sketch, then you're not as well preconditioned as you like. But you're putting it into an established Krylov subsidy solver, it's still going to work just slower than you want. So I call that graceful failing. Okay, that's in contrast to this is sort of the first way people used uh, to solve this, where we're just going to, this is called sketch to solve nowadays. Or I'm just going to sketch my problem like this. I'll put phi in there and just make a smaller least squares problem as like I'm sketching the residuals. Now I just apply phi to A, phi to B, and I sketch this and then put it into a standard solver. Um, this can work, it's just not as nice because it has a worse dependence on epsilon. You don't get high accuracy solutions this way. And furthermore, when it fails, it fails catastrophically. Okay. So that's another way to do it. However, sometimes we do this, there's some cases where we're not trying to reduce flop count, but rather think of B, the right-hand side of a system of equations. Sometimes I'm sampling B from a system, like sampling polynomials from something, running a simulation. And so asking for each sample of B is expensive. So in fact, I want to solve this equation without even knowing all the entries of B. That's a case where like choosing phi to be a random row sampling is not a bad idea. You don't have as good results, but you don't have to form all entries of B and that's the dominant cost for some problems. Okay, so what's important depends a lot on the problem we're talking about. Okay, there's other things which I won't talk about, but for pretty much any kind of uh, linear algebra thing you can think about, there's been some sketching applied. Okay, so let's talk about something uh, other than linear algebra. We're gonna talk about k-means clustering. Um, we're gonna talk about because I have a result on it. Also, it's, it's a reasonable thing to talk about because it's fairly straightforward, right? If you've seen machine learning, you've seen k-means because it's sort of the, the simplest thing you can do for, uh, for clustering. So how does it work? So let's suppose we're in p dimensions here, say p equals two for this drawing. We have uh, eight data points. Okay, we're gonna pick a number of clusters. Let's guess we want three clusters. So k means picks, it guesses three cluster centers, uh, initialized somehow arbitrarily, maybe at random, however you want. We guess these cluster centers with the stars. Those are my cluster centers. Okay, and now we're gonna do assignments. So I'm gonna say each data point, I'm gonna find what's the closest cluster center to it and give it that label, in this case, color, okay? so. This data point here is closest to the blue star, so I'll give it blue color. And this point is closest to the, the green star, so I'll give it green. Okay, so I make some assignments. So I do my assignments. Now, now that I have assignments, I'm going to forget what these means were, the stars, and recompute the means as the new means of those things in its cluster. Okay, so I do that. Um, okay, now I just, now I, Again, pick new assignments. In this case, I go back. So those things were previously blue. After shifting the mean, now they become green because they're closest to the green. Okay. I do that, and then I recompute the averages for each cluster. Okay. And then I keep iterating, and in this case, I stagnate. I don't go any farther. Okay. So in fact, it's, it's pretty trivial. This converges because every time I move things around, I'm only making things better. 
and there's only a finite number of uh, assignments, that's a discrete quantity. So if I'm only making things better and there's a finite number of things, then I have to end. Okay. I don't end at the best solution, that's not true, uh, but I do end, okay? So that's k-means, very famous because it works pretty well and it's super simple. Okay, okay so what are the costs involved in k-means? Well, the costs are, okay, I need to update the cluster centers by averaging their little, the things assigned to them. And then I need to update my assignments. To find my assignments for each data point xi, I check how far away is it from each cluster center mu k. Okay, the cost of a single one of these is order p, because these are all p-dimensional vectors. I do this for all k clusters and for i equals one to n data points. So overall, that's my complexity. Okay, so let's make that faster. Our idea here is to make it faster. Let's sparsify our data set. But let's do it in the way I told you earlier. Let's first apply this preconditioning transform F and D to make things about the same size. I do that once at the very, very beginning. Then I sparsify. Then I do my clustering on this data set Y. Okay, uh, and then I get my cluster assignments that I can go, um, yeah. So wh why would I do this? Well, because if, if this is sparse, I could reduce this cost. But there's another reason, it's for the memory. So if I have a giant data set, so my original data set P by N is not sparse, it's a very big data set. If it's say 100 gigabytes, I can't put 100 gigabytes on my laptop that has maybe 32 gigabytes. So I can put it on the hard drive of my laptop, but not on, in the main memory. So what do I do? Well, I can load it piece by piece into memory, do something with it, and then throw it away and load another piece. If I have to do that, that's very slow, because I'm gonna have to do that many times potentially. And moving things from one memory to another is very slow, okay? If I sparsify it, and sure, if I sparsify this by a factor of 10, maybe everything computes 10 times faster. If I'm lucky, it's a little trickier because it's sparse, so you have to be careful. But the big thing is, okay, if I take it from 100 gigabytes down to 10 gigabytes, that fits in memory, and now it's probably a thousand times faster because there's no memory transfer other than one initial transfer. Uh, so we have examples here uh, on the classical MNIST data set. So we take MNIST, which is somewhat high dimensional, 784 dimensions, because it's 28 by 28 pixels. Uh, 21,000 examples, here are a few. Um, okay, and then I'm gonna cluster them. Okay, so let's look at how well we do. Um, this problem's a little funny because it's not a clustering problem, it's a classification problem. So we have true labels. So I'm gonna use those true labels to give what I call the ground truth. You don't normally have that for clustering. Now, if I didn't, if I pretended I didn't have those true labels and I just did k-means, I get these things. And those are my cluster centers. It looks pretty good. So clustering risk classification looks pretty similar in this case. Okay, but this took many passes through the data. I had to load it from memory many times if this was a big data set. So I don't like that. Let's do something better. So here are three, uh, options. One is let's sparsify the matrix without that preconditioning transform load. When I do that, I get something that looks okay, but definitely not quite the same quality, not bad. Here are some other methods that were proposed uh, about eight years ago or so that use some of those other uh, Johnson Linus Strauss ideas I showed you. Okay, the issue with those is that they apply the same thing to each column. So they can do a reasonable job at classifying the where they can say where each point is assigned to. But if you want to go back and say, what does the actual cluster center look like? To do that, you say, okay, now I take the average of all my data points. But that's, in this case, that's in the reduced space. So if I average in that reduced space, I can never go back to the original space. It's like an, a, in a matrix that's not invertible. Okay, so I can't ever go back. If I try to do that with like a pseudo inverse, I get complete garbage. Okay, now you could do it in one more pass through the data. Okay, you have to load the data and do that. So they would, a, you'd pay an extra cost for going through the data. That is an extra loading it from your hard drive to your main memory, okay? Now, in our case, we don't have to do that. We can, if we do our preconditioning and then sparsify, we get excellent results and we can do it all in one pass. Okay, so that's, that's sort of the benefit of what we're doing. To be a little more quantitative, if I tune how sparse that matrix is, so here's extremely sparse, here is only 30% sparse. Then if I look at how well do I classify, uh, it gets better and better as I get less and less sparse. And you can say for a reasonable thing, like say 10% sparse, it's not too bad. 
uh, it's much better if I do what I said rather than not doing the preconditioning. And that's what's just one pass through the data. If I can afford a second pass through the data over here, I get this gold line, and now I get extremely accurate results with that second pass, if I can afford the extra pass. Okay, here's an example where I wanted to do a big data set, so I took MNIST. There's a variation called infinite MNIST, where they just make MNIST bigger. So now I have N is uh, about 10 million, and this thing's actually big enough where it's about, okay, 56 gigabytes. And so this is a few years ago, my laptop at the time could not handle 56 gigabytes, okay? So what do I do? I load it in, in one pass, uh, I load in a chunk, so I made chunks of about a gigabyte, sparsified it, after sparsification, um, see, did I say how much? I did 20 times undersampling, okay? So I did a lot of sparsification. So now it's 20 times smaller than this, that's easy enough to fit my laptop, uh, even with the overhead for the sparse matrix. And when I do that, it's much faster than loading the whole thing in uh, and doing classical k because it takes many passes, so it's very slow. Okay, so I have a 40 times speed. Okay, and now I want to talk about tensor factorizations. So this is, well, we're gonna talk about tensors. So let's introduce tensors. Tensors for us are not like multilinear operators, they're just fancy vectors that have been reshaped into multi-way arrays. Okay, so I have a tensor that has, say, n ways, uh, n different dimensions, each one of a certain size. And I'm gonna change notation a little bit. These are pulled from different figures. So sorry, notation is different, n means something different. Okay, so we have a tensor. Uh, matrices and vectors are just special cases of tensors. And tensors come up all over the place. A lot of data is naturally a tensor, and then we often reshape it into a matrix because you know, we, we know how to do things with matrices. But the inherent format is often a tensor. So examples would be things like this Enron data set, uh, where each entry is a user who sent an email, a user who received an email, the keyword in the email, and then what, what day the email was sent. It's a very sparse matrix, right? Because most, right, there's only a few, there are a lot of things, but it's such a huge dimension that most things are, are zero, okay? So we're gonna wanna be able to handle sparse tensors. So things like the count sketch are good for sparse tensors because they only touch the non-zero entries. Okay, other examples here are like co-author networks. Okay, so those are some examples of sparse tensors. We often have dense tensors also. An example here would be like from scientific simulation. So I simulate something, like a combustion simulation, or, and uh, maybe I have three dimensions for a uh, quantity, like a, say velocity, and then I do different time steps, maybe I have other variables too, um, so on. So I often get a very large tensor, and this is actually, you know, eight terabytes is actually fairly moderate size, right? If you go to what people are doing on uh, the best supercomputers, they're always pushing the limits. So this thing is always sort of at, close to the max of what the machine can handle. Okay, so we don't wanna store it. In practice people don't store it, but you might say for scientific simulation, maybe you would like to see what you computed, right? We often look at the endpoint or collect statistics along the way, but what if you wanna like visualize what happened? Could we, could we compress that? So people have been working on tensor compression for these kinds of things. Okay, sometimes works okay. That's not really our problem right now. So uh, tensors come up all over the place. Um, so these things are so large, and I want to get back to what I said with the infinite MNIST, I'm often focusing on not just flop count, but on memory, right? So can I fit it into memory? Can I do a few passes loading it from main, from hard drive into memory as possible? Okay. Or maybe it's even streaming, like simulations are just ongoing. You want to deal with them as they come. Okay, so with tensors, we're going to have to have a little bit of, of setup. So if I have a, major, uh, a tensor X in the script format, I'm going to write it in this format to represent a matrization. So matrization means just reshaping it. So a mode one matrization means take my tensor and take the column fibers here and stack those as the columns of my matrix. A mode two tensorization or matrization means take my row fibers of my tensor and stack those as columns of my matrix. And, uh, mode three means take my tubes of my original tensor and stack those as my columns here. And if you had higher dimensions, it'd be similar. So I can go from tensor to matrix. Okay, I wanna do things like I wanna do a tensor times a matrix. Uh, sort of like a partial trace if you've seen that. So if I write it like this, it means I take my tensor and I take a tensor times a matrix A along the third dimension. What does that mean? Well, 
We can write a formula for that. But the way to think about it, though, is to say, take my tensor, reshape my tensor into a matrix. And so if this is a, a mode three product, then I'm gonna do the mode three matrixation. Then I multiply my matrix A times that, and I reshape back to the tensor. Okay, so I can do these kinds of operations. Okay, so what's our goal? We're gonna to try to do a tensor factorization. So I'm gonna take a large tensor and try to decompose it as a product of small factors. So think of like an eigenvalue decomposition or an SVD from matrix only for a tensor. And when you take an SVD from matrix and generalize to a tensor, there's different ways to generalize it, which correspond to different tensor factorizations. So if you've seen like the CP decomposition, that's one way to generalize. We're gonna to talk today about the Tucker decomposition. That's one way to, to generalize here. And the way to think of it is we have a core matrix here, and then I multiply in each dimension along these factor matrices. Okay, so I'm gonna use G for the core matrix, uh, and then I'm gonna multiply it is tensor times matrix products along these core matrices. My shorthand notation for all of this is this sort of double bracket thing right there. So I have a large target matrix X and I want to find some factorization like this. Now it's sort of trivial. I can just choose G equals X and A to be identity matrices, but instead I'm going to constrain G to be of a smaller dimension. That's going to make it non-trivial and give me the compression. Okay, so I could do it for compression, I could do it for other reasons too. Um, sometimes we do data analysis on these factors. Okay, for example, if you've seen spectral clustering, you do, you find eigenvectors and you cluster on those eigenvectors. Okay, think of something analogous here where I could do, think of these as something analogous to eigenvectors and I could cluster on those eigenvectors. Okay, so we want to compute a Tucker decomposition. Um, how do we do that? We can cast it as, as an optimization problem. So I have my target matrix, uh, my target tensor there, and then I want to find the best core tensor G and factor matrices A to minimize the discrepancy between these two things. I might, I might not be able to make this exactly zero residual because I'm forcing these to be smaller size. So maybe I can't make it zero, but I'm going to make it as small as I can. Okay, so I want to do this. And in general, this optimization problem is not tractable to find the global minimizer, but we can still attempt to do stuff. And the simplest thing to do, maybe not the best, but the simplest is alternating these squares. Okay, what that says is, let's take, I wanna minimize over all these things simultaneously, but if we observe that if I fix all of these but one, then I'm linear with respect to that one. If the other ones are fixed, that's a linear least squares problem and I can solve that, okay? And then I'll sort of alternate and, and do that. Okay, this is known as the higher order orthogonal iteration. The orthogonal, there's a bunch of details to make it efficient in practice, which I won't go on too much, but it looks like this, where I'm gonna iterate until I get convergence. And each step, I go through all different factor matrices. I have capital N factor matrices. So I'm gonna define the little nth one, which is this A here. I'm trying to find the one that minimizes this. And all the other ones, I'm gonna fix at their old value. And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna solve this thing here, but then, Okay, that's a tensor, that's kind of awkward. If I matricize the whole thing, it looks like this in terms of matrices. Okay. So I have this giant Kronecker product structure right there. And then same thing for updating the core, there's some things here. If you are, are, are quick, you'll see that things don't look quite right. It's because we do some orthogonalization, so don't worry about that. But the thing to think of it, it's like Gauss-Seidel, where I fix all but one factor and update the other thing. Okay, so I want to do that. Now, as a least squares problem, this thing looks very, very large. Um, and so at first we thought, okay, we can speed that up. It's so large, it's way overdetermined. How could I make that faster? I could sketch. It turns out in this case, that's not really the bottleneck, partly because sort of some of the details I'm, I'm hiding is that we orthogonalize these A. So when I do the gram matrix for the normal equations, because they're all orthogonal, when I take the tensor product, I can sort of put each A, I can commute it in a certain way, and I basically get the identity matrix back, okay? So, in fact, I can solve the normal equations very quickly. Well, I, I can solve the inverse part of that. But in the normal equations, I do have to apply the adjoint of this to my data. It turns out that's the bottleneck, which is maybe counterintuitive. But this is a giant uh, matrix. It's my entire tensor that I've uh, matricized. Okay? So it turns out that is a bottleneck, and that's the part that we can sketch. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. Um, so we're going to do that, and we're going to do this 
by doing the tensor sketch. So I introduced the tensor sketch. It was a bunch of little count sketches. The careful thing we did here is that we apply a big tensor sketch once up front to the data. And then inside each iteration, I'm going to have slightly different tensor sketches where I hold, I take out one little different count sketch, depending on which iteration it is. So I'm going to reuse these little count sketches. And that's going to let me be very data efficient. Okay, so I do that. And if I'm careful, then I get something that's very fast and it's one pass in my data. Okay, so we did this. Uh, this is what I was talking about. We have another variant that sketches a little bit differently. So here we're sort of sketching inside my least squares problem. We can also sketch, I could take my normal equations and sketch my normal equations, leaving alone this part because that part is so efficient in this case because it's so orthogonal. Okay. So we have two different methods. I didn't talk about this one as much. But the point is, if I apply standard methods, like the standard alternating least squares without doing any sketching, if I apply it to a tensor, so here I take a three-dimensional tensor, a three-way tensor that's sparse, but not that sparse, and that when I get to like a million by million by million size, standard me methods just can't deal with it because they have too much memory involved. Okay, now I have a sparse tensor, but like intermediate quantities are dense. So they just fail, whereas our method keeps going to as large as we want there. Okay, and furthermore, it, it's fairly accurate. Okay, so our, our error is fairly small, um, and our runtime is not bad, and it's memory efficient. Um, here's an example where my student uh, took a video of him walking past his video camera. And so he's walking, so here's the scene, this is out in graduate housing, just the trees in the background, and then he walks past it. And he's wanting to cluster on some time features. And he wants to be able to say, when is it that he walked by? So he wants to get some features as a function of time and then cluster on those and say, okay, when I walk by, that's one cluster. When I don't walk by, it's another cluster. So he did this. So you're gonna have three classes and he's gonna cluster them and says, okay, here's my initial setup. Uh, I'm not doing anything. And then for some reason he has another sort of boring class two. And then here, uh, when he walks by, that's where it jumps up to class three. Then nothing happens. Then he walks by, it jumps up to class three again. How did he do this? He did a tensor factorization where he took this giant film which is a three-way tensor, space X, space Y by time, uh, very large, 38 gigabytes, did uh, a Tucker factorization on using our, our technique. And then now he got something of, rank, so it was rank 10. So now he has something of time by 10. That's fairly small by machine learning standards. So you can do clustering and that's this is what he got there. This is not a state-of-the-art clustering method. This is sort of to, give us an example of how do we get like a large data set that's dense. So this was a dense example, everything else is sparse. Um, okay, I think maybe I should just stop there because um, we're pretty much out of time. So if you have questions later on gradient free optimization, I can talk to you about that. But I think that's it. Uh, I don't think so. Um, like if you found the best Tucker, I don't think that's unique. Yeah. How stable is the Uh, reasonable. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't always give you the best, but it gives you something good enough, and and it's fairly reliable. But in which cases is the reliability not proven versus the is it is that uh, an issue? Uh, somewhat. Well, in, in like many things, people use it beyond like beyond the intended uses. Yeah. So like, like for example, a lot of these things for Gaussians, we have we could sort of figure out a pretty good idea of what the constant should be exactly. Like, if you want to say, how big should that dimension P small b? With a Gaussian, we sort of know the constants. We can figure them out. So we could say, oh, it should be like 37. 
But for most of these other things, all the proofs are like, oh, it should like scale with a constant times log P. And we don't really know what that constant is. So in practice, we're kind of guessing anyhow. So um, yeah, in the real world, the difference between like heuristic and rigorous is, is not that large for most of these. But in some cases, there is a difference too. Yeah, or like, I mean, if you took the same sketch, if you took, say, a pure Gaussian sketch and compared it to these other sketches of the same size, the Gaussian would almost always do better. So like that is a real effect. Okay. There's right. one question on Zoom. Okay. Um, Cooper, do you want to unmute? Yep. Um, I was wondering uh, for the Kronecker fast uh, JLT, you mentioned that there. Can you hear me okay? Hey, Anzo, we on. can't hear you. Hold on, Cooper, we're having problems in there repairing it. It could be. I can just put it in the chat as well. So let me just switch. Um, here, I'll just switch to uh, my laptop. And then, oh, you go ahead, Cooper. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. OK. Um, yeah, I was wondering for the Kronecker Fast JLT, you mentioned that uh, there were some trade-offs between the two analysis analyses. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak to that a little more. It seems like one or the other would be tighter. Um, it just, yeah, it's more like in a scaling regime. So let's see. Um, yeah, so, uh, okay, so here, if I recall, so I don't have their result up and I don't have it fresh in memory, but if I recall, we scaled poorly, like if Q, Q is our number of the number of ways of the tensor, if Q is very large, so maybe even a very small dimensional, like maybe it's a, a four by 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 four tensor, we scaled poorly because Q is fairly large there. Um, so in terms of Q, I think we're worse, but I think in terms of most of the other variables, we're better. Uh, so, I mean, I think our result is nice and that we, we scale well with most of the ones we mostly care about, but there is a small regime where I think their method is better. But is it, is, is it the same method or just different? Does uh, the method yeah, true, it's the, same, it's the same method, right? So in fact, you can write a theorem that just says p small should be can be as small as their bound and our bound. Yeah, you, you can combine the theorems. I see. Okay. Just different analysis. Yeah. Uh, there's a slight difference. In fact, ours assumes the input has a chronic structure and theirs doesn't. Although you wouldn't really want to apply it if your input doesn't have a chronic structure because it won't be so fast. That's another small difference. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, so so it's deterministic in that we, we're not putting any prior on X. So we think of X as, as fixed. Um, yeah, then all the randomness is randomness we impose, so we control those distributions. Doesn't no, no, yeah, we're not changing that, right? Same as, same as the other analysis. Kevin, do you have a question? Yeah, so just to make sure I was understanding this correctly, these methods are all applied on columns, which is one data point at a time. All, all of them except the one sparsification one. Right. And then, but in practice, uh, are you concatenating multiple data points together and just the biggest thing to fit in memory? Or? Uh, yeah, so we wouldn't concatenate, well, we, we load them in chunks. Okay. So we do a matrix matrix multiply if we can. Okay. Yeah, so you just load as many as you can afford. And then, does that lead to any issues down the line for like data set shuffling? Um, it would be an issue for streaming data, maybe, yeah. but that would be an issue for anybody who's streaming that you couldn't that's, really that's shuffle what it. I was getting at. Yeah. yeah. How does this? How do you? How does this interfere with like, streaming like something like Kuznet? Right. That um, if it really is streaming and dictated to you, then I, I would I would say that's a problem. But it's not. It's not like only my problem. It's everybody's problem. Right. Like, exactly. yeah, we don't know what to do. Uh, if you're just loading it from a hard drive, 
then then you could sort of shuffle it as you load it, and that would be okay. Uh, that, that we okay that we take it, it's gradient free but not derivative free I was careful with the title because <laughs> <laughs> because we need a few directional derivatives like a constant number so the idea is it's meant for high dimensional problems where if you have a p-dimensional gradient that's a lot to ask for and there's cases where automatic differentiation does not is not applicable. So assuming that's not applicable, what would you do? You could do finite differences, and you pay order p to find the gradient. We're going to ask for a constant number, like 10 directional derivatives. We're going to do that by projecting the gradient into a random subspace, which is equivalent to finding some directional derivatives. Uh, and so we use a random sketch. We use a horror sketch in that case. Yes? All right. Um... I, I imagine Stephen can take some questions afterwards. I'll be here all year. Um, but it, we're, we're at time, so let's get let's, uh...